So it's great to be here today. I'm going to be talking about, uh, again, I'm Dorothy Sears from ASU. I'm relatively new transplant to Arizona. I came here just less than a year ago from uh, San Diego, from UC San Diego, and I still have an adjunct appointment there, but I'm really excited to be part of uh, Arizona State University and in the College of Health Solutions, where we're thinking a lot about healthy behaviors um, and implementing those in uh, the real world. So today, these are the topics I'm going to be talking about. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about obesity and insulin resistance and um, the 24-7 world. So we really are living our lives across all 24 hours of the day and um, doing this across seven days of the week. Uh, food intake timing and health, what I mean by that, uh, aligning our food intake with circadian rhythms and what a lot of people are calling time-restricted feeding. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about diet composition. I'm going to be talking about what time we're eating the food. Um, what the mechanisms are and the feasibility of aligning food intake with circadian rhythms and then um, some conclusions and take-home messages. So, as we know, there is a global epidemic of obesity, and associated with that is an increased risk for type 2 diabetes, uh, fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. My pointer's not working. Ah. Um, oh, there's one. Hallelujah. Yay. Okay. Uh, cancer also, there are at least 16 different types of cancer that we know are associated with obesity, so this is becoming more and more of an issue of concern, and of course cardiovascular disease. So um, with increasing obesity, there's also increasing a uh, phenomenon called insulin resistance. This is very much a part of uh, the metabolic syndrome, as Dr. Westman um, was mentioning in his presentation. So I want to talk a little bit about insulin resistance and why it's of concern. So first of all, um, insulin resistance is um, when the hormone insulin is, is not working properly, so the action of this hormone is impaired. So who here in the room has heard of the hormone insulin? Raise your hand. Awesome. OK. So um, this hormone is responsible for making sure all of our nutrients are stored properly. Um, and when a person has insulin resistance, they have what we call compensatory hyperinsulinemia. So if your cells in your body are not listening to the hormone insulin, then your body is going to be secreting more of it to get the job done, to get those nutrients stored. And so as a result, people with insulin resistance have higher fasting insulin, and they also have higher postprandial or after-the-meal insulin. And this is particularly maybe not as big of a concern for folks in the room because you guys aren't eating as many carbohydrates. But um, in the case of consuming foods with carbohydrates, and then this is a particular problem after the meal because uh, the insulin levels will be much, much higher. So it's also associated with impaired glucose regulation um, and also elevated postpandial glucose, again, if there are starches or sugars in the meal. So this leads to um, a diagnostic marker, a clinical marker called um, hemoglobin A1C being elevated. And so I just have a schematic cartoon here of a, a cartoon of hemoglobin. It's a very common protein in the blood, and it's a very useful marker for clinicians to use to gauge what is a person's exposure to glucose. Has anybody here in the room had a hemoglobin A1C test? Right, good. So some of you, or most of you, are familiar with this, this test. So I'm going to speak a little bit about this marker, because in some of our studies, we use the hemoglobin A1C to give us a sense of how does food intake timing relate to glucose control. And insulin resistance is also associated with systemic chronic inflama inflammation. And um, one of the markers that, we're interested, that we uh, commonly use to gauge this is called C-reactive protein. This is another one that some people in the room might have had their physicians uh, call for this test, C-reactive protein or CRP. And lastly, on this slide, uh, as I mentioned, insulin resistance is a cancer risk factor. So tumor cells really like high glucose, they love high insulin, and they love inflammation. So insulin resistance is a prime condition for cancer risk. Insulin resistance is increasing its in prevalence worldwide. In the United States, about a third of um, the U.S. population has uh, diabetes of the people who already, sorry, who about a third of our population who does not have diabetes 
has insulin resistance. Um, and some people call this pre-diabetes. Um, insulin resistance is the primary defect leading to type 2 diabetes. So if nobody got insulin resistance, nobody would ever get type 2 diabetes, at least the classical form that we know of. Um, and um, people, once they have type 2 diabetes, they still have insulin resistance. So this is a problem for many millions of people in the United States. So the contributing risk factors um, leading to insulin resistance uh, include uh, genetics, which you can't do anything about that. You got your, your DNA, you're stuck with that. Um, but we can do certain things about our environmental risk factors, including our diet and our lifestyle behaviors, which is, we're here today to hear a lot about that. So, um, so some people say, well, you know, can't we just take a pill? Well, we're not here to take pills, right? So, yes, we can take pills, but we don't want to. There are effective non-drug alternatives. So, oops. So what I like to talk about is feeding behaviors that can modify our risk for these um, uh, insulin resistance and inflammation-related diseases. So as I started out talking about um, how we live in this kind of 24-7 society in the United States and other places in uh, first world countries around the world and, and even second and third world countries, uh, we have access to food 24 hours. And a lot of the fast food joints are advertising their late night menus, like come in to Taco Bell and get our 50 cent, you know, whatever. And, you know, and, and here's me working on my grant about time restricted feeding. <laughs> you know? Um, we're working late at night in our offices. Um, then, you know, uh, let's say you go to New York City, you know, those restaurants are open till like two o'clock in the morning and people are eating really late at night. Um, lights are on. I mean, we're up and active all the time as a society in general. So how is that impacting us? So it turns out that at least for the eating part, and I'm not going to talk about the lighting because that's a whole other thing, but um, eating outside of a circadian rhythm is associated with increased risk for chronic disease and cancer. So let me just mention first what circadian rhythm is. I'm going to go into it a little bit uh, in more in, in a subsequent slide. But circadian rhythm, has everybody heard the word circadian rhythm before? Raise your hand. Right. So circadian means around the day. And for us, our day is 24-hour day. We've got approximately a 12-hour light cycle where the sun's out, it's daylight, and about 12 hours where it's nighttime. It turns out that everything on the planet has a circadian cycle. Everything alive, sorry. <laughs> everything living. So... Um, that's what I mean by circadian rhythm. I'm going to go into a little more detail later. 